does the person you are with encourage you to read you have to ask what does he bring for me roses or books if someone has a stake in making you better that person will push you towards books books are what we all need Well, Acharya Prashant, it is a true honor to be here with you today talking about climate change uh, and global warming as uh, probably the biggest fundamental challenge facing humanity and, and the other creatures of, uh, of the earth at this moment in time. Um, uh, I am the director of the graduate programs in sustainability at Bard College in New York. I'm an economist. Um, and along with uh, my colleagues, uh, we are heading up uh, an effort to create a worldwide teach-in um, on climate injustice scheduled for March 30th, 2022, uh, and then carrying on into 2023 and 2024. We're seeking um, to really tap into the, the, the deep concern uh, that so many educators, teachers, students, uh, staff members at high schools, at colleges, at universities around the world, have about climate change. And our belief is that most students now understand, you know, basically that the, the fundamental science of climate change, they, they get that we're putting pollution in the atmosphere that's trapping heat, that's causing the planet to warm up. Um, but by and large, they're just in despair about this. Um, and as a consequence are ignoring it because there's nothing they feel like they can do. And, and so they just live their lives you know, kind of pretending that it's not happening. And, and the idea of the teach-in is that with these thousands, tens of thousands, millions of educators around the world who care about climate change, are concerned about it, that we can help move these students from a sense of despair to a real sense of, of possibility and agency. Because the fact is, this is a, an incredibly exciting and decisive moment to be a human on this planet because more than any other generation before ours and before young people's generation, they have the ability to profoundly change the future. The work that they can do in the next year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, um, can, can, will have an impact not only on their own lives and the lives of their children, but in fact, for every human being who's gonna walk the face of the planet from now until the end of time and for millions of species. So that's our mission. Um, and uh, we're uh, e eager again to, to get thousands, tens of thousands of, of schools uh, around the world globally involved. Um, we uh, have translated our website into Hindi um, and uh, have got resources to support teachers. But the basic idea is a bottom up conversation, tapping into existing concerns, existing knowledge and helping communities move towards solutions. So. I'm very eager to get your take on how this might work and kind of what the basic issues are and what the basic obstacles are. I'm very glad to be speaking to you, Dr. Iban. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, someone like you who has put in so much of interest and effort in this most important area facing all of us, the entire humankind, and obviously, the young population um, is uh, here to talk to. And uh, uh, yes, uh, as you said, it's uh, a very critical juncture um, for this generation and rather for um, the history of mankind in general. Uh, we might use this uh, crisis to bring about a rather fundamental shift in our consciousness, in the way we live, we approach life, we approach each other, we approach natural resources. Or uh, we could just squander this opportunity and uh, the worst case scenario is we might just uh, move towards our own obliteration. But yes, as you put so much emphasis on hope, Obviously, we have to 
um, understand that our basic nature our fundamental nature is of wisdom and understanding and that's what uh, uh, we must stand by and um, that's where we we stand you see uh, i'll straight away um, introduce you to my position on this uh, see it's a man made thing right when we talk of climate change hmm, the word anthropogenic is the most important hmm? it's a basic thing but i'm reiterating because uh, that's the thing we give the least attention to we are treating climate change as if it is something outside of us as if uh, some asteroid from outer space came over and delivered all the gases and trapped all the heat in our atmosphere uh, i want to i want all of us to pay attention to the fact that we have done it it is our action and every action is representative of the state of the actor we are in a particular state internally and therefore we are doing what we are doing externally now our internal state has brought about this external action this external state and we are not addressing the the root cause we are not addressing the way we are and the way we have been probably all throughout our history we do not want to address that because probably that's too painful and that would cause too te too tectonic a shift in in our entire uh, life system so we want to treat it as one of the problems that face us in, in that's a very fragmented approach hence the solutions that we are thinking of are also pretty external in nature so we want to move to greener technologies we want to have carbon sequestering mechanisms uh, we want countries to pledge for uh, reforestation we want uh, auto manufacturers to come up with uh, newer technologies and such things mm? uh, and and countries squabble with each other who should bear the brunt and then issues of climate justice and such things crop up uh the thing is i want to i want us to inquire into it uh, are we even understanding where the whole thing is coming from really and if we do not understand that is it not a fundamental conclusion that we will never be able to solve this problem and all the actions that we are trying to have as as remedial actions would just be consolations hmm? we would be entertaining ourselves and uh, we would be rather gratifying ourselves that we are doing something meaningful and fruitful and nothing would uh, come out of it and i'm not just uh, just hypothesizing in a vacuum you see we started taking this thing uh, a bit seriously in 1990 right that's the watershed year and we are more than 3 decades from there now and not only have we failed to uh, reduce or neutralize carbon the fact is today we are releasing 20 to 40% more carbon than we used to do 3 decades back and that's with all our climate action and there is really no hope that uh, we are going to achieve carbon neutrality any soon hmm. my country india for example even as a matter of pledge has quoted 2070 now that to me is just too far off and this kind of action is just too insufficient so see we are doing it we are doing it and there are two things about us that are causing it they are so fundamental that we don't even talk about them those two things are the numbers that we are and the numbers that are represented by our per capita consumption 
and even these two are fundamentally one the inbuilt human tendency to take consumption as an indicator of the fulfillment or success of one's life that's the reason we multiply and that's the reason we want to consume more and more and climate change is hardly anything but a function of our numbers on this planet our population and the per capita consumption by each person of our species unfortunately irrespective of the variations in culture thought religion ethnicity all that we have across the world about one thing we all are fully in agreement and that is that we all need to have a good time by consuming more and more be it the indian the chinese the american the african anybody we all want to have a happy life and about a happy life the thing is consumption consume more and let there be more people who can consume more so the the, the slogan really is more to consume more and nobody seems to want to address that because that is just too explosive an issue probably especially in a democratic setup you know the fundamental thing is we are just too many and if we remain as many as we are then i don't want to sound uh, a nihilist or something but i don't really see hope unless we address that one thing equally if we can address that one thing especially to youngsters then obviously there is a lot of hope and a great possibility and that possibility will then not relate only to climate change but to everything that we do as human beings we'll be able to lead richer deeper more meaningful lives more loving lives lives of compassion lives of less strife and lives that have a certain fulfillment so so that's my simple position in a nutshell obviously uh, we'll be going into the nuances of uh, everything but uh, i thought it would be better to just you know put everything on the table uh, right away that's such a clear statement uh, of the challenge that we're in i mean fundamentally there's eight and a half billion of us soon to be nine soon to be ten uh, half the folks on the planet are barely getting by and living on a few dollars a day and everybody is aspiring to more um and this has led us to already be fighting over water and topsoil and fish and forests and biodiversity and it's the fundamental reason the planet is heating up i i would maybe differ with you a bit because i think that while i i think that in the long run humans need to figure out how to come into right relationship with themselves and with the planet um in in terms of this quest for more um uh i i think that with the climate issue in particular there is a window in which technology can buy us time um and and so uh i believe you know there is sort of good news on on sort of the the endless uh, numbers of people on the planet you know population growth rates are slowing down finally um india uh, china i believe this year for the first time has tipped into a uh, a negative growth uh for for population um so i'm hopeful that humanity can we can see our way through you know and we can stop at 10 billion and then slowly have the population decline create more space for people create more space for for creatures um but i feel like we're at this moment this critical juncture where we have to get this right um technology can buy us time but i agree fundamentally it's how do humans heal themselves and and really develop a, a healthy relationship with each other and with the planet right dr ivan i i i too want to be optimist on that count in fact because i want us to to be there in the medium run at least and i want us to uh, to not only exist but exist Uh, uh in a healthy way in a fulfilling way therefore i want to be realistic about uh, the threats that uh, face us you see yes that's very true that uh, as economies prosper 
uh, then birth rates go down and uh, at some point we achieve population stability but then again uh, i want us to inquire into what makes people in a developed place have fewer kids is it because they become full of empathy and concern is that what is happening in let's say japan or germany and what causes people in a place like let's say let's say bangladesh uh, or parts of india still uh, in the north to have uh, relatively very high uh, fertility rates is it because they are intrinsically violent people compared to the japanese or the germans no that's not the thing uh, even when uh, the fertility rates are going down they are going down because of the desire to consume life even more uh, deeply hmm? i do not want to spend child on the kid because i want to rather spend time vacationing and touring the globe now my question is having a child has a great carbon footprint and if i do not have a child because i want to consume all kinds of material prosperity and i want to be a globe trotter i want to be flying let's say 30 to 40 days per year is that going to reduce the carbon footprint compared to the decision of having a child or is it going to be just equal to that so mere reduction of population in itself will not be sufficient because the reduction in population itself will be a by product of prosperity and prosperity itself has a carbon footprint so please tell me how is just prosperity going to help when prosperity itself means carbon prosperity means carbon our emotions mean carbon everything that we do simply means carbon because at the center of our existence is is a lot of carbon it is indeed no and i i agree with you i mean uh it, it is essentially the the pr the reason that people are having fewer children um and not only in the in the, the 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 wealthiest countries but as i said also in china now um is fundamentally they they feel like they can't afford them um because uh of the expectations that life is about is about consumption um and is about having that car and that apartment and all of uh, you know all of those things um and and so uh Yeah, I'd love to hear how how do we then from your perspective make that transition to um a, a better and more healthy relationship with each other and with the planet and and de-emphasize the the need to have a closet full of of clothes that you never wear or you know th three cars and you know how how do we move in that direction the first of all i want to give uh, due credit and acknowledgement to technology i'm just not uh, decrying the role of technology we need better technologies today but i see their role more as uh, that of nlg6 there is a lot of pain there is a lot of current immediate pain and therefore we need better technologies to manage that pain technology cannot really cure this situation but can give us a temporary relief also it can give us um, uh, a, a longer rope um, with which yeah. to yeah maneuver our way towards a solution so the window that we have i suppose uh, that's uh, what you said the window that we have is broadened by technology so first of all yes due credit to technology now um, i'll i'll want to put forward the reservations that i have with respect to technology technology shows us a false dawn hmm? so if i if i for example um, get an air conditioner in india we have these star ratings on acs hmm? yeah. and if you have a higher star rating it means that the power consumption is relatively lower right and india is a, is a relatively warm place and as people get prosperous one of the first things that they want in their homes is more air conditioners initially people start with having air conditioner in one of the rooms and then they want air conditioners in all two rooms three rooms and if they have five rooms so let's say we have a young one in the family who has been sensitized 
in in the uh, in the school or in the college about the the enormity of this problem of of climate so he he raises his hands up and he says no nothing doing we cannot have so many acs and it's not good for the climate hmm? Uh, the elder sister comes in and says, look, technology has brought in this new AC with a five star rating and it consumes far lesser power. Now, that brings us, brings in a false sense of complacency. We used to have uh, these uh, very antiquated cars that we um, kind of inherited from the British, ambassador cars. And they used to be really great instruments of pollution of all kinds, including noise pollution. So they were phased away. Now you would hardly see any of them on Indian roads. Now we have really sleek modern cars. In fact, we share a lot of them with the, with the Americans, with the Europeans, and we have the same models running here. But what has happened? What has happened is that the numbers have increased so very exponentially that the total emission count is nowhere close to what we used to have in the 70s or 80s. So in spite of better and greener and more efficient technologies on the net, we stand uh, very poorly compared to where we did even four decades back. So from a macro perspective, is betterment in technology really helping or or is it enabling the consumer of the technology to consume more and more with impunity and with the false assurance that you see I now have a moral license as well. I am not a climate offender anymore because the, the technology that I am consuming is so very green. No, no I, have, I have a Tesla now rather than a Suzuki or a Hyundai. The thing is, is a Tesla really carbon neutral? Well, you know, I, I agree with you, and I think we're getting back to that fundamental question of kind of too many people consuming too many things. Um, but I would say that there is a shift, right? That, I mean, it's not just green technology, it's low carbon technology. And, and again, how do we buy, how do we extend the window? How do we buy time? We have to move uh, uh, to a 100% a renewable energy economy um, globally, right? Um, and, and stop burning fossil fuels. That's one thing we have to do. And the other thing we have to do is figure out how to uh, develop regenerative agriculture techniques that trap carbon in the soil and that also raise the income and livelihoods of farmers, um, small farmers in particular. So those, those two technology changes, a shift to 100% renewable energy, and that means battery powered everything, um, and, uh, and regenerative agriculture that pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and increases the well-being of farmers. Those are the two things that, that buy us the time. Um, now, uh, uh, it is true that there's so much greenwashing though. Um, and what we have to keep our eye on is, okay, I have all these new technologies, but is my carbon footprint going up or down? <laughs> that's, you know, as an individual, as a, as a nation, as a company, that's the measure. And we can't be distracted by these shiny new toys that, claim to be green or whatever, when they really are just enabling more consumption, more pollution. Um, so uh, so I, I think we can make progress there. But then again, I, I agree with you that ultimately the problem uh, lies in, uh, in us understanding our relationship with each other and, and, and with, the, with the earth. And, and how do we get there? Because that is the hard how do we get eight or nine billion people to, to, to have that kind of a consciousness shift? And, and I think the opportunity, as you say, is now. I mean, because we are in crisis um, with the earth. Yes, yes. I mean, I think we have to begin with our schools. There has to be a basic self-inquiry process with the kids. I don't know whether it sounds outlandish as I say it, even if it does, let's uh, think about it. Why not ask the kids, why are we born? Why do we exist at all? And, and we don't want to come from a religion or a scripture or a particular ideology. Let's have a freewheeling discussion on this thing. Why do we exist at all? What's the purpose? The thing is, once 
we are sensitized to this question and it becomes um, something important in the mind then the purpose of life is no more mere consumption and when you do not have a, a, a great purpose a lively and, and a and a lovable purpose to live by then the only thing one lives for is just consumption and and unfortunately it seems that a huge majority of the people across the world are living very purposelessly and hence they live just to consume and that's the reason why we measure the the progresses of countries uh, through their gdps that's why everything that we want to talk of has to be talked in in numbers and particularly in numbers uh, denoting money uh, I, i'm again uh, not a money hater or something i'm rather pro life and pro purpose how will you stop a person from 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 just trying out the next thing in the market if he has nothing else in his life and how will you stop a company let's say a consumer goods company from producing uh, the next uh, attractive and alluring thing if the owners and the stakeholders in that company want nothing but money because that's all that they have in their life you see yes. we 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 talked of uh, reaching carbon neutral stage let's have let's have great technologies but i just want to open the question aren't we mm, trusting ourselves just too much and if we look at the track record of our species do we really deserve to be trusted so much i mean right now one particular element carbon is the problem how do you know and how are you so sure that in the process of dealing with carbon we will not make nitrogen the next big problem it already is coming up right yeah. nitrogen is an issue just that this issue will probably uh, become large enough and frightening enough three decades later sulfur is an issue hmm? and all kinds of heavy metals are are an issue and but but we are not talking of heavy metals so much today we are not talking of sulfur so much today we are not talking of lead and arsenic so much today we are not talking of radioactive stuff so much today in mitigating carbon i am afraid we are going to prop up some other problem because we as a species i am i am saying with all humility are not wise enough though we think we are just too smart so we try this we try that and then we you know the no that's that's uh, that's that's a representative of the oldest civilization speaking to the newest one <laughs> so, uh, well please please help us help me understand how we become wiser because i mean i i, I do agree with you i think the, the idea of purpose is interesting um i run an mba program in sustainability so it's a it's a business program um but uh the the vision of the business program is how do you build a business that's actually in business to solve critical social and environmental problems like climate change um how do you do that right um and of course it has to be financially successful it's a business it has to make enough money to cover its costs but how do you put purpose first um and then have financial success and profitability follow what's interesting is that this idea of purpose driven business has become very popular in Europe and the United States at least um as kind of the way to the better way to make money right because if you can your people want purpose in life and if a company can provide its employees and its consumers with a sense of purpose then um it will be more successful um and then of course you get into this question of is it greenwashing you know and is it just a smoke screen or is the company really dedicated to purpose and one of my professors hunter lovens likes to say that hypocrisy is the first step towards real change um so that if you at least get people committed to purpose then you can hold them accountable and begin to move them along along those dimensions but you know I, human life has evolved under capitalism right to elevate consumption as the road to status right that and status is what we're hard in my opinion is what we are hardwired for 
by by evolution, right? Because you know we all seek status in our communities, and the way we get it is is through consumption. How can we build societies in which people gain self worth and status without that? I mean, we can look to indigenous communities, for example, in the United States. There's a potlatch culture in the northwestern U.S. where people actually gain status by giving things away. The more you gave away, the 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 higher the status that you achieved in your community. Can we make that shift? No, no, the thing is, why do we need status at all? When we said that we need to initiate uh, this discussion among young kids, why don't we ask them this question? Why do you need to draw your self-worth or self-esteem from somebody else? Because as long as we need those things from others, we will need a lot of goods from the world. You see, these two things are so so very interlinked, no? I want my self-worth to come from the world. And I want objects that supply me happiness to come from the world. Must I be so dependent on the world? It is not a condition of great helplessness. No? The world can withdraw its sanction anytime. The world can withdraw the status it gave to me anytime. Universities, when they offer degrees, they, they attach a rider. You know, even the degrees can be reskinded. My degrees are not with me forever. So if I attach my identity to my educational qualifications, I'm running a risk and I'll be afraid. Should I, should I really live like this? Must I really live like this? You talked of sustainable businesses in the MBA program uh, you, you referred to. And when it comes to MBA programs, I've been through a pretty prestigious MBA program. So. What really is the definition of success? When do I call myself successful? And if I do not have a, a rigorous definition of success, then no amount of money will suffice. No? When do I say I'm really successful? A related question is, and uh, you would find it interesting, doctor, why do businesses fail? Why do businesses fail? I have mentored a few businesses and in my limited experience, I have seen businesses fail because they, they fail really to live up to the expectations of their founders. Businesses don't fail. They, they, are, they, they, they just prove too inadequate compared to the ambition of those who launched them. No? So do I really require to be a superstar to have a successful business? No. I just need to have modest ambitions and my business will be successful. You know? Unless the idea is really rotten. You know, I, I cannot sell cooms to, to, to what I'll be, let's like, say, two decades later to a person like me. You know? So unless we have that kind of a mindless idea, businesses uh, are not really going to fail and achieving profitability or sustainability in business is not going to be such a Herculean task. But because we want just too much from life, hence businesses fail. You know, uh, I want to, to, to spend this much, I want to have at least this thick a bottom line and that's not what I'm getting. So I would rather shut shop. Yeah. This, this yeah. kind of a thing happened. I had thought I would come up with an IPO in the fourth year you know, break even in eight months. And, and that's not materializing. And why am I not having that break even thing in eight months flat? So if I love really what I do, will I ever let it fail? That's my question. So let me get back to your idea of engaging young people with the idea of purpose, right? What, and helping them understand that purpose is not about dying with the most toys, as we like to say. Um, you know, that should not be your purpose in life. Um, and I think that young people are open to that. I mean, there's something about young people that they, 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 are, they are searching for that. And, and perhaps that should be the goal of the teach it, right? Is to help young people question this sort of commitment to endless consumption. Um, how do you, if you, and, and I see many young people in, in the United States who, you know, uh, are, 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 you know, choosing veganism for, you uh, climate reasons, you know, uh, living plastic free lives, you know, trying to explore what it really means to be in kind of a right relationship with, with 
themselves in the earth. So how, how do we, how do we, I mean, but it's a small group, right? It's 1%, you know, how do we expand that appeal of that, of that kind of questioning of life to more young people? Teachings, just as uh, uh, you are approaching them, we'll have to teach, we'll have to teach. And I suppose any, any good business today to survive has to first of all generate awareness. Therefore, it has to be in the business of teaching, right? Because, mm -hmm. because the right product today would need an aware buyer. You just cannot sell the right thing to the wrong person. If I am someone conditioned by generations of consumptions of advertising and, and misplaced cultural values and somebody comes up with a great product or, or great service, I am not going to buy that. So if I come up with something that really is good from an internal perspective, from an ecological perspective, then I'll have to first of all generate awareness. And I'll mm -hmm. have to be prepared to go that extra mile and put in that much of extra effort. So the business of teaching is what this world needs today. Hmm? I'm not saying one has to be uh, in that sense just a teacher, but you will have to be a teacher as well. Yeah. You want to come up, for example, with a with a with a uh, great vegan cafe or, or a great vegan recipe or a, or a packaged vegan product in a place let's say like uh, like North India where there is not much um, sensitivity or awareness regarding veganism and where dairy production uh, and consumption is a cultural value first of all you will have to educate the population and you will have to educate the population to a point where they are prepared to accept the product even if it turns out a little expensive though typically it won't be an extra expensive but even if it is uh, education will make it uh, acceptable and affordable to people uh, same thing when it comes to clothes when it comes to automobiles when it comes to even uh, tourism destinations you know or when it comes to to means of uh, means of gratification you know, that's what we need today. We cannot have, you please tell me, but otherwise I, I'm curious to know, how can I have a great business in a market that does not value that business? How will I get my employees? How will I get my vendors? How will I get my customers? Even the government is not going to support me. Rather, I would find that the government is subsidizing my competitor and that competitor is feasting on all kinds of rotten and polluting technologies. But because that competitor has a market around him and in a democracy, it's the numbers that matter. So the government seems to be more aligned with him. How will I survive in the market? So I have to be an educator. I know that's going to be tough. But then as a young person, when we are talking of that, that segment, as a young person, I ought to have the, the stamina for, uh, for troubles. Why not? That's what would probably make life love worth living. Yes. Yes. Well, um, I, I think we're in agreement then that fundamentally education is the key um, and that we need people with uh, a, a different vision of, of how humans should be living on the planet to become educators. Um, and... I'll just say that for our, the vision of our teaching really is just to recognize that many, many, many teachers, many, many students, many, many staff members at, at universities and, and high schools and secondary schools, they understand the depth of the climate crisis. They know that this is existential, right? They know that um, if we do not change course, uh, that we are going to be experiencing a world where in, in many parts of the world it will simply be too hot to live, um, where sea levels will rise, where crops will fail. Um, and, 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 and they're frightened of that, right? They're, they're, and it's, it, it is a moment to really rethink our, what are we doing on this planet if this is the direction that we're headed? Um, and so the purpose of the teach-in 
is to just bring all of those people together and have this conversation. Uh, yes, we can buy time with technology, right? Yes, we can do that. But at the end of the day, what is this telling us about, about humans um, and, and the way we're living on the planet? So that, that is the purpose of the teach-in. It's really creating a community, a global community of educators um, and giving them the chance to interact with each other. We do it on Zoom calls, uh, uh, but also to bring together people in their community with a similar concern to start to have these conversations. And, and when, when we are talking of uh, consumption, doctor, the very basic uh, kind of consumption, food, just as we don't want to talk of uh, our numbers on the planet, because that becomes an emotive issue in a democratic setup, we also do not want to talk of our food choices. But the fact is, and the numbers are out in the open, that food is probably the largest, or if not the largest, the second largest contributor to greenhouse gases emission. Yep. And we don't want to talk of that. And the thing is, carbon emitting food choices are also mostly food choices that involve cruelty towards animals, that involve a distorted relationship between our species and the other species. The thing is, when we say that we must take care of ourselves, that we must care for our future, how will we bring in that kind of self-love? I invite us to think about it. How will we have that kind of self-love if we do not have love for the other species that inhabited this planet? I mean, the very thing on my plate is coming uh, as a result of slaughter. Why then will I not be disinterested in stopping the slaughter of the biggest carbon sinks on the planet, the forests. For the sake of my food, uh, we are killing not just directly, and even as we have spoken over the last 30 minutes or so, I'm, I'm, uh, millions of animals have been slaughtered in these 30 minutes just for our appetite. And not only are these animals being slaughtered, forests are being cleared, just so that we can have farms to raise these animals. No? Now, when we are clearing those forests, we are erasing the biggest carbon sinks that we can have. Also, we are robbing the species of their habitat. And in, 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 in doing all that, how are we displaying any kind of self-love? So self-love, when it comes to talking of our own interests as species, self-love has to be inseparable from love towards the wider ecosystem. Unfortunately, that's not what our education is teaching young people. Otherwise, it's very, very easy to take care of this problem. All the deadlines that we are setting for ourselves, be it 2030 or 50 or 70, we can overachieve even before those deadlines, because it's we who are doing it. That's the challenge and that's the opportunity. It's not uh, uh, being sent down by the gods. It's not being conspired by the aliens. We are doing it. And if we are doing it, we may as well stop it right now. But to stop it, we require the kind of consciousness that acknowledges itself as the culprit that acknowledges that it has been living in ignorance and it has been living in ignorance all throughout these centuries just that the ignorance was not displaying its devastating consequences because our numbers were not so large and because the industrial revolution had yet not happened therefore we did not have this much power to destruct in our hands now we have numbers and we have the industry and we have the technology and the know-how the knowledge and we have great power and all this is a very, very explosive combination. Hmm? So that's where we are and it's a very slippery slope, very slippery slope. I'm, I'm uh, fighting it in my little way on a daily basis and I see the, the challenges and the challenge that I'm seeing, Professor, is really not technological. Jealousy, you cannot treat through technology. 
ignorance you cannot treat through technology lovelessness you cannot treat through technology all the all the in human darkness within you cannot deal through technology and when i talk of veganism or when i talk of plastic or when i talk of population when i talk of climate the obstacle that i face i repeat is not technological it's not that people are not aware of better technologies it's not that people are not aware of the numbers it's just that people have not been sensitized enough people are not loving enough the the norms that we have the the norms post the enlightenment period in europe the religious values that we have the distorted religious values that is not the not the really spiritual values uh, uh, they are not at all conducive towards a solution of of this problem education i think unfortunately fortunately is the only thing that can save us we require i mean huge armies of dedicated educators we require tremendous propaganda we require publicity in all ways in all forms uh, we require people to go knocking each home and then and, and get the doors open and barge in and have tutorials and if that can happen then probably we can have governments to to tax the right things to subsidize the right things and only then we can have public policy in the right direction well you know i i i certainly as an educator myself and someone who is organizing a worldwide teach in on climate and justice uh, that is a very well spoken position um and uh i i agree with you in that that there are so many solutions that are within our grasp um and diet is is obviously a huge piece of that um and and um and engaging people with in that conversation is is part of what we want to do for the teach in uh and and i think food is is a, a wonderful avenue towards engaging people into their their sense of relationship with the planet um mm-hmm. because it doesn't you don't have to go very far from what's on your plate to understand how you're how you're impacting the world uh, for me i wrote a book um about 15 years ago called fighting for love in the century of extinction and it in some ways it kind of goes the other way which is how do you what is it that that motivates to even us to even care mm-hmm. about about the species of the world why why do we why why is that the right thing to do and it fundamentally it's because if you step out into the world and you just look at the sky and and you touch uh so a handful of earth or you uh, uh smell the smell coming from the bushes um that's something we don't want to lose it's what we are losing right is that connection to that world outside and and that's a big part of of human purpose i think is um protecting that world so that it will be there for for our children and the, the, for all all humans to come the thing there is to go out and and be there with the natural aromas and and just 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 watch an animal or if it is safe enough just just touch a small animal or or or, or lie under the starry sky and be able to pause and meditate you first of all need values that tell you that you do not need to be chasing success all the time you know think of an undergrad student why will he spend his nights watching the starry sky if he could rather slog for grades and ensure a better job offer i'm not saying one should not study and not secure better grades but the thing is do we have a culture do we have the kind of education that incentivizes reflectiveness meditativeness basic spiritual values like self inquiry or as teachers we are all the time motivating our students and rather pressurizing them to to do this to be better to achieve more to have higher grades and cgpa and a better job offer and internship there and a job there and all those things you know if the if the student success is measured by all these things please tell me why will he just spend time sitting by the sea and doing nothing 
I don't get me wrong. I'm not advising that one should just sit by sea and do nothing. No, one should. One, one should, actually. For a large part of a day, one should do that every, Wonderful. every, every month. Every, you know, that, that, is, that is a beautiful way to spend we'll your life. We do well together, doctor. <laughs> yes, we, we will. And, you know, we're coming to the end of our, of our hour, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to you for the work you're doing um, and for the perspective that you're sharing. Um, it's not one we hear often uh, because uh, uh, we are all so caught up um, caught up in this race uh, that's uh, that we need to, we need to step off. So um, thank you very very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. It was a wonderful hour, it was a wonderful hour, and I'm sure we'll have more such conversations in the future. Okay, good to speak with you. Great, thank you, thank you so much.